Today's show is for you. And what I mean by that is today, I'd really love to just take your questions. Um, so if you have questions for me, please start writing them in early. But also what happens is that each week, because the questions go by so fast, sometimes we miss the really good ones. And so what I often do is I go back and I read your questions. Also, because many people don't catch this video live, they, they watch it later and then they post their questions later and I'm not live to answer it. So because you're on different time zones and all that. So I like to go back because your questions inspire me. They inspire me on topics, on what to speak about. It also tells me what I need to explain more about or go deeper into. So what I've done is um, I've gone through your questions from last week the ones, the questions which we missed answering last week. And today I want to start by answering some of those. And as I'm answering some of those in the interim, please feel free to post um, more questions. Now, here's the thing um, for your question to be answered, bear in mind that it needs to be something that's interesting for a lot of people. And the other thing is, yeah, because I tend to choose questions which I think that a lot of people will gain, um, will get something out of having answered. The other thing is that um, it's great if you can get straight into the question without too much of a backstory, because if there's too much in the post to read, we usually tend to miss it or it's too much to sift through to find the question. So if it can go straight into the question, <clears throat> that's always a great help to get noticed and, and to get answered. Um, so think in terms of what would be helpful for a lot of people and also know that if there is too much of a backstory, it usually also also means that it's something that's not going to apply to a lot of people. Um, so though that's kind of how we, we choose the best questions. The other thing is, if it's a question that I have answered many, many times, chances are we probably won't answer it again. And we would suggest that you go back and watch some of my other videos. So anyway, without much further ado, I want to start with the first question that I have here on, on hand. And last week, um, Bridget, um, Bridget Elizabeth Larson, she asked, do you still feel the profound and unconditional love and, that you experienced during your NDE within yourself or does it fade away with time? Love from Denmark. I love that question because um, it is something that comes up from time to time, but probably not something I've spoken about enough, is that the NDE is not like a dream that fades away in time. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't fade away with time. It's more like a door that opens. And once you've had an NDE, it's like you've walked through the doorway and there's no turning back. You can't unknow what you know. And so you always have access to that space of unconditional love. But what happens is that the people or our desire to fit into the society around us who are in a space of fear, that can have a tendency to bring us back down to this place of fear. And this is why I share the lessons I do, why I do the events I do, why I write the books I write. It's to help people to stay in that space. We are able to have experiences like an NDE without having to nearly die. And that's why I share it because you don't have to die to experience something like that. But the trick is staying in that space. Now, here's the thing left to your own devices, you would be able to stay it, stay in that space. But here's what brings you out of that space of unconditional love. It's, it can be anything from the guilt of the people around you not feeling it the way you do. It can be um, the news that you listen to that's happening in the world all the time. Um, it can be people bringing fear to you, bringing fear-based messages. Uh, all of these things, among many others, it can be anger, um, people doing things or you feeling exploited and you feeling um, in a space of anger, all these kinds of things can drop you out of that space of love. But here's what the way I tend to look at my life now. Um, when before the NDE, 
I used to do things like meditate to take me to that space. And real life was fearful. And I had to escape real life by creating experiences that took me into that space of love. After the NDE, it's the other way around. My life is, the way I like to look at it, is that I have created a life, because my near-death experience taught me how important it was, I have created a life that supports being in that space of love nearly all the time. And whenever something shakes me out of it, that's when I feel, okay, what is it that's shaking me out of it? What do I need to heal so that I can go back to my natural space, of which is feeling the unconditional love? So in other words, we here have been conditioned to believe that our natural way is this way of fear, which is what we are conditioned in this world. And we're constantly trying to create the space of love or escape to it when we discover it. I'm telling you to flip, flip the way you think and think the opposite. Your natural state is the state of love, even though you've been conditioned the opposite. But think of it that your natural state is the state of love. And when things take you out of that state, you need to heal what it is about those things so that you can always be in that state of love. And the kind of things to look at is what is making you feel guilty? What is making you feel fearful? And then when you start discovering those things and healing those things, like for example, I don't watch the news anymore because it's, I just know that that is not reality. That is just uh, mass media trying to sell sell bad news because that's what sells. So, and, and there's a lot of other things and people will challenge you. And this is again, what brings you out of that state of love is people challenging you and saying, oh, you've just got your head in the sand. You're not in tune with reality. So the thing to ask yourself is how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? You want to feel in that state of love because you want, that's what you want to take out into the world with you. There is a lot more I can say about this and I will down the line create a video of how to actually stay in that state of love. But I've also created um, a whole online course where I can interact with you about how to stay in that space. But I'm, so I'm gonna just go into my next question for now because I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that before we finish this, this video today. But just remember one thing, it's not about escaping into that space of love or escaping so you can meditate more or escaping so you can attain that, that little enlightenment for a time and then thinking of the real world as this reality, which is where we have to have our noses to the grind and deal with real world fears and things like that. We have to actually flip it in our own head and think in terms of the real world is the place where we are in this feeling of unconditional love and start to question why have we created a world where we are feeling fear most of the time because that's not the real world even though that's what you've been conditioned to believe. So I thought that was a great question from Bridget so thank you for asking that. JC King last asked week is the other side right here is it just invisible or can you tell us how it is please? Now I wanted to answer that question too because it's very related to the previous one which allows me to get into more clarity about the previous question about being in that state. Um, so I have given this analogy a couple of times, but it applies here. If you imagine that you have been born blind and you've never been able to have sight. Now I'm aware that if you are born blind, that you probably have a more developed um, intuition and more developed sixth sense. But for the sake of this, I want you to just imagine that you were born blind because even if you have a more intuitive sixth sense, you're still down to five senses um, because you don't have sight. So you've lost that sense and then your other senses, your hearing and so on, kind of compensate. However, if you are born blind, there are certain things that will be more difficult for you to perceptualize or to conceive. Things like um, measuring distance purely by sight. 
um, color. You won't be able to understand or perceive color. Um, if somebody hands you a, two pieces of cloth and says one's red, one's blue, and the cloth is identical in every other way, and you're feeling them, you won't be able to tell the difference um, and you won't be able to tell which one is red and which one is blue if you were to mix them up. Um, and so in your own mind, it'll be hard for you to perceive what color is if you have never seen color in your life. It's also hard for you to perceive things like um, height of a, of a structure. Um, if someone says to you that building is 12 stories high, it'll be very hard for you to perceive what does 12 stories mean unless you actually walk up the 12 stories and you walk through each floor and you start to understand, okay, this is what it means to go up. But you cannot stand on the outside of a building and know that that building is 12 stories high. Even if you travel in an elevator, can you actually understand what it is that's going on? You get into a little room, you press a button, and you, when you get off, you're somewhere else. It's almost like going into a different dimension. So there's a lot of things conceptually that's hard for you to understand if you were born blind. Now imagine if one day, after a lifetime of being blind, you had sight. In that one day, Think of the clarity you would have of the world around you. Suddenly you understand what height is. You understand what a 12-story building really means without having to travel the stories by stairs. You understand what an elevator does. You understand what colors are. You understand what it means to have a blue sky or to have a bird flying in the sky. You've never seen a bird flying above before. You've never seen a rainbow. Um, all these things suddenly make sense in a different way, in a whole new way, and it's nothing like your, what you had imagined in, in your own mind. Um, and it could be that you had imagined them better, but it, it could be that um, it's more beautiful than you imagined. But whichever way, it's nothing like what you had imagined. But what happens though, is that even if you were to go back to be blind again, if you lost that vision and you went back to being blind, your, the way that you navigate the world would be forever altered. You would, um, you, you would perceive the world differently, see it differently. Your decisions would change. The way you navigate the world would change. And so you can't, you can't unsee what you saw. Now here's the thing, everything you saw was right here surrounding you. So what I'm trying to say is in other words, the other world is right here surrounding you. But just because you can't perceive it with your five senses doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now imagine if you were in a world where everybody around you was blind, everybody grew up blind, sight didn't exist. And if sight didn't exist, all of you would perceive the world very differently. Now imagine if in that world, a few people, a handful, a percentage, 1%, 2% of the people had sight and 98% did not have sight. Those 2% or 3% or whatever it is would perceive the world very, very differently. And they would navigate the world differently because they have sight. But the whole time, the other 90 something percent would be telling them that, no, you're wrong. It's your imagination. And that 90 something percent, because they're the majority, they would be creating a world that is f created by blind people for blind people. And that handful of people would constantly be being questioned or being put into doubt for being able to perceive the world differently because another sense has kicked in, um, which allows them to perceive something more that for the other people do not exist. So in other words, think of it as um, if, if it was a world created by people who didn't have sight for people who didn't have sight 
and you had a, a few people who had sight who were trying to explain to them um, that actually this exists and they were trying to describe it and the people around them who didn't have sight were thinking they were explaining something of another world of a far off land while they're saying no it's right here but it's just that you need another perception another sense to kick in before you can see it in this case the sense of sight in our case the sixth sense or the sense of intuition this is why i say that we are actually six sensory beings who have been programmed and conditioned to live in a five sensory world created by people who believe we are five sensory beings. So we actually, there is a fourth dimension and above there are six senses and more. We just have to learn not only to cultivate it, but to trust people who all already are in um, fully open and have embraced that other that sense and we all have the capability to cultivate it but what prevents us from cultivating it is a disbelief in it and it's also what pr also prevents us is in a judge is having judgment towards it and thinking of it as being something that's woo woo or crazy or labeling people who have a fully developed sixth sense or above um, labeling them as being crazy or being witches um, or being um, guided by the devil or evil or whatever else labels we give them that is what prevents us from cultivating it fully so that is a great question jc king i wanted the opportunity to answer that so thank you for that um, I had a question from uh, Shaili or Shaili Parihar, who I believe has written a couple of times, and so I wanted to take the opportunity to answer her question. And uh, Shaili's question is: I've gone very deep into Dr. Hugh Lenz' Hop um, Hoponopono method, and now several of you have actually written to me with that question, which is why I wanted to answer it. Many people have said that they have gotten into uh, Dr. Hugh Lenz' work and. Uh, his Hoponopono method, which also Dr. Joe Vitale teaches as well, which is cleaning up our past memories, which shows up in people and situations and uncomfortable negative thoughts. The love um, method uh, that they do is constantly chanting, I love you, I am sorry, forgive me, thank you, and thank you. So basically the Hoponopono method is to clear your energy by saying, I love you, I'm sorry, forgive me, thank you, and thank you, and to stay in a place of gratitude. And that method, although I myself um, have not read up much about it, so forgive me if, if anything I say is not quite right, but my belief in that method, which I believe is very powerful, I have only positive things to say about it, but the idea is very aligned with things I say in that um, when you clear your own energy, you are clearing the energy of the people around you. And this is 100% aligned with the things I believe in. And um, only recently people have started writing to me about this method. And I was, in fact, happy to find that it actually exists in this traditional way. So if you are into it, please continue to be into it because it offers you a method to stay in a space of gratitude that allows you to clear your energy. So why do I say it's aligned with my message? The reason I say it's aligned is because I believe that we are all connected. And because we're all connected, when you bring your energy into a room, other people feel it. When you enter into a room, you feel other people's energy. This is why I say it's so important to love yourself. When you love yourself and you allow the universe to express itself through you, you are uplifting your energy so you can bring an uplifted energy out into the world with you. Um, when you don't love yourself, when you're judging yourself, you're beating yourself up and you think it's selfless to give and give, but you give to the point of being drained, you end up having a very drained energy. So when you take yourself out into the world, not only are you um, taking a drained energy, which is draining other people, you require other people's energy to lift you up. And sometimes we are drained. There's nothing, you know, don't judge yourself for that. You go through times when you're dealing with physical challenges or you go through times when you're dealing with emotional challenges or um, dramas that are going on and you are drained and you need other people to lift you up. But this is why 
It's important to reach towards being uplifted so that we can be there for each other. Allow, allow other people to uplift you and allow yourself to uplift other people. Allow yourself to receive upliftment. Because here's the other thing, is that many of us who are giving and giving and we allow ourselves to become drained because we only give, we are not very good at receiving. So many of the people who are givers are not good at receiving. You need to be aware that it is good to receive as well so that you receive the energy from people who are uplifted so that you yourself can be uplifted so that when you take yourself out you are helping to uplift other people. The way we uplift the world is by uplifting ourselves. If you do not receive upliftment and you feel that it is, um, it is selfish to give to yourself then not only are you not doing yourself a favor, but you are not doing the world a favor because you are also not sharing your energy with the world. So the thing that I love about Ho'oponopono is that the belief is that when you have healed everything within yourself, that you will see the healing taking place in other people. There were experiments conducted the, where Dr. Hugh Len um, when he was given a case file of people with mental illness and he read through it, what he did was he cleared all of these issues within himself and then went back to the institution where these people were and it was cleared within all of those people, which I think is very, very powerful and it is a great way of viewing the world. The one thing that I ask you to caution of is that when other people around you are sick or unwell, do not blame yourself for being that way. Do not feel that um, it is my fault that I have brought this on me, that I have all these sick people around me. No, don't judge yourself, don't blame yourself, because when you do that, you're lowering your own energy. Your only work is to uplift your energy, to love yourself. And the more you love yourself, the more you allow the divine to work itself through you. You allow yourself to be used as a channel for the divine. The less you love yourself, the more you judge yourself and the less you love yourself, the more you're closing off your energy and the divine is unable to work through you and send you messages. Dr. Hugh Len's message is very similar, but delivered in a very different way. And different people resonate with different ways of delivering the message, but his end result is very much aligned with what I say. So thank you, Shaylee, for your great question. Um, the other question I wanted to answer is from Lori Jane Layden Chung. Um, Lori says that she was on the cruise with me and didn't get to ask her question, which is, what are my thoughts on miscarriages? Are those babies souls not wanting to live in this realm or lifetime? So there are a few things that could be happening with miscarriages. It could be something related to the person carrying the baby where they really need to go through a few more things before they're ready to receive that soul. What I would like people to do, even if you have suffered from miscarriages, even if it's several miscarriages, just know that the right soul will always come to you, always. You will be connected with the right soul. Maybe in the case of the miscarriage, that was exactly the job of that soul, was to give you that experience of having the miscarriage so that you desire to have the baby more. Um, I have known people who have not wanted to get pregnant, but then when they do, suddenly they're like, they have mixed emotions. And when they start to feel that, okay, I might be okay with it, they have a miscarriage. And the miscarriage is what causes them to feel that strong desire, <clears throat> excuse me, to get pregnant again. So in other words, they had no desire to get pregnant or to have a child, but there was a child that was wanting to come through them. And the, 
and that but the child didn't want to come through them while the parents were not ready to have a child and so that parent needed to have a miscarriage to feel the loss of the miscarriage so that it creates the desire it's like oh my gosh um, I, I miss having that and very often a miscarriage creates a desire to actually work at getting pregnant. So that's one reason, but there could be many other reasons. But what you need to know is that um, you don't need to worry about the soul of the fetus that miscarriage. They are absolutely fine. They did, <clears throat> they did what they needed to do and they completed their purpose. When you actually have the child, it may even be the same soul as the one that you miscarried. It may be a different soul because that soul's mission may have just been to um, come to you for that short time as a fetus and leave you. Um, and even if you adopt a child after having a miscarriage, you are still getting the right child because maybe the desire in you to have a child was not there until you had the miscarriage and this led you to adopt. And by a series of synchronicities, you will still get the right soul, the one that is meant to be with you. Um, I know so many people who have adopted children and their children have so many of the, um, so many not just traits, but things like appearance, physical appearance, that they, where they look like their adoptive parents or grandparents. I know of so many, it's uncanny and, it, and there's no way because there's no genetic connection, but there is a soul connection. And remember, soul connection is much stronger than genetic connection, much stronger. Um, I encourage people to adopt because there are so many children in this world that need parents. So. Um, adopt because you will still get the right soul child. So thank you for that question, Laurie Jane. Um, and I have a question from Kang Hae Lee, who is from South Korea, and she was on the cruise with me. Uh, and she says, during the cruise event, you mentioned briefly about how empaths should choose people to work with or what kind of people empaths should choose to work with. It would be great if you could talk more about it and how you choose people you are working with or things to consider when employing people, especially when an empath wants to start his or her own business. Thank you. Okay, so basically it's about empaths in the workspace. Um, and I have had to learn this for myself going through a lifetime of not realizing that I'm an empath. So let's start with when I was out there in the workforce looking for a job. Um, when you're an empath, it is really important that you, when, when you are being interviewed for a job, I want you to mentally be conducting your own interview with the boss um, or the employer who is employing you. And I want you to really um, be, I, I don't want to use the word ruthless, but really be loving to yourself to the point of being unafraid of turning a job down um, even when it's clear that they want you for the job, um, but be really brave about turning it down if it doesn't feel right for you. For an empath, this is exceptionally important. And I will give you so many reasons why this is important. Um, empaths have a tendency to be people pleasers. And when somebody likes you, you have a Dif you have difficulty saying no to them. When someone likes you, you will be kind of like, oh my God, they like me, I need to do this. It's like such a thrill for you that someone likes you. So when you go into an interview, I want you to feel that you are also interviewing them and ask yourself these questions. Is this the kind of place that will nourish my soul? Is this the kind of place where I can express my soul, my spirit? Is this the kind of environment that I want to be working in long hours? Will it squash my soul? Um, can I follow my calling here? Will it dim my light? When you're being interviewed by the potential employer, um, you have to ask yourself, 
What are the vibes I'm getting from this person? Is this person overriding everything I'm saying? Um, am I going to feel that they're not going to understand that I'm an empath? Now, um, I want to say here that I don't like to use words like toxic people, toxic environment, but there are environments and people that could be toxic for you, but it doesn't mean that they are toxic people. It could be just that they are maybe more aggressive or more go-getters than you are comfortable being. And there's nothing wrong with that. In our world, you need to be that way and for many people. And, and it is who they are. It is they are also being themselves and expressing themselves. So there's, So don't feel you need to judge them. But at the same time, you need to honor who you are and say, will I be ex able to express my light working under this person or will they be dimming my light because they want their light to shine? And will I find that I will constantly be taking the shadow to them and will I feel, and am I okay with it? Because there are a lot of people who want to be in the shadow and that's okay too. If that's your role, that's your role. Because for some people, shining their light means being in the shadow of someone else and it makes them feel good to see other people succeeding and knowing that they contributed towards it because they know that they're contributing towards the good of the world. And so you need to really get to know who you are. And yes, Danny actually is one of those people and uh, he is amazing and he is strong and he is not weak and he does everything he can to support me. And, and I have an amazing team of people who do that. But that's the second part of it because <laughs> the reason I brought in Danny is because he's back there dancing around doing this. <laughs> He's like doing this at himself when I was describing that there may be, you know, it may be, you may be shining your light by supporting someone else. Absolutely. But my point is, you really need to ask yourself when you go in for an interview, is this position, is this job, is this employer, um, are they going to uh, dim my light or am I going to be able to express myself in this environment? Um, and watch out for certain things because if they say yes, they want you. Um, empaths have a tendency to say yes just because they want you, not because you want the job. The other thing an empath has a tendency to do is you tend, uh, um, an empath, we tend to overcompensate, over deliver, and even in the interview, make promises beyond what is required for the role and to under, um, uh, how would I say, like undercharge for what they do. Empaths have a tendency to do that. So you may get employed because um, you are cheaper than other people or you cost less and deliver more, but which is also, again, if it brings you great pleasure and that's enough money for you, that's great. But the question is, are you burning yourself out doing it? So empaths really have to um, question these kinds of things if you're gonna work for someone. Now the other side, the flip side of the coin, if you are employing someone and you are an empath, many empaths don't succeed in leadership positions. And there's a reason for this. Um, they don't succeed as corporate heads, leadership positions, company owners, because an empath tends to burn the candle at both ends. And here's what I mean by this. An empath, let's say you are a company where you're dealing with clients. The empath will want to deliver the best possible they can to their clients. And then you start to bring in a team of people to support you to do this. But when you bring in the team of people, when the people come in to interview you, you will have a tendency as an empath to employ people that are not necessarily the most qualified to support you, but the ones who are the most needy and who need the job the most. And you will overlook many of their qualifications. And then here's what has a tendency to happen, is that because they're needy and they will have their stories and their dramas and they will come to you as a boss, you will mother all of them or father all of them and you will take care of them and you will give them the time off that they need. Um, 
Um, and so on the one hand, you will be serving those who work for you and you will be serving those who you are supposed to be delivering your work or your product to. So you will find yourself sandwiched in the middle of being there for your clients and being there for your employees and, and the people who are supposed to be supporting you. So be aware that you have a tendency to do that. For me, it took years of um, lessons of learning that brought me to where I am today, where I have a team of amazing people who really, really support me in what I do. Um, I didn't even know that this is what I was destined to do. And I allowed my own light to shine through. And what you find as an empath, because here's the other side of it. An empath, when they allow themselves to be who they are, are really in tune with that sixth sense that I talked about earlier, that other world that exists around us. So you have to allow yourself to tune in to your higher self, allow yourself to tune in to your guides, to your other side, um, and allow that higher self to express itself through you and allow the people to come into your life to support you um, who to in expressing that who you are. So what I did was I surrounded myself with a tribe of people who supported me, not with the intention of employing them. No, everybody who works with me and my team today were my tribe before I actually asked them to work with me. They were people who were brought to me by Wayne Dyer. They were people who are members of my family, my husband, my brother. They were people who I met through my Facebook page who were aligned. They were brought to me. They were my tribe. And that's how we came together. They were not people that I went out and employed. And so I continue to do this. I continue to listen to synchronicities as I expand on my team because it's it, and also I make sure that um, they are actually able to do what they can do, but at the same time that um, that they're able to support me in what I'm doing. And so basically we have a very good relationship, a very good understanding. And that is so important for an empath, because remember, as I said, an empath has a tendency to get sandwiched between the people who are supposed to be supporting them and the people who they are supposed to be supporting. And you end up supporting both sides. And when you do that, you become drained and you lose sight of your actual mission. Now, I just want to throw this in. When the people who are supposed to be supporting you are actually doing their work, and thank goodness my team are amazing at it, um, when they are supporting you in your mission, you end up doing something that because you're following your guidance system, you end up doing something that in the, in the end supports them as well. It's a full circle. It's a circle. When you don't do that, it's like a candle being burned at both ends and you are the one being burned out. So I hope that I made myself clear. Um, so thank you for that question, Kang Haley. That was so important. Um, and Susanna Brahm, I, I think this is the last question we have on the list. One more, One more after this. Okay. Um, Susanna Brahm, dear Anita, I'm going through the, she's going through cancer treatment and she's tried unconventional and now um, she's going on to other big and serious things. Um, she's doing unconventional and conventional together, but she's learned a lot about herself and would like to write a book. Um, and it's and she's not sure if she should and she shouldn't. So I actually think if that's what you feel, that's your calling, I think you should write a book. But what I want to say here now is because you mentioned going through cancer and what's working, what's not working. Um, one of the issues I have is when somebody is diagnosed with cancer or any illness is suddenly they've got this label and their whole focus is on doing what it takes to get rid of the symptoms of that label. I have to get rid of these symptoms. And when people say the alternative doesn't work, there's a reason why the alternative doesn't work. It's because when we go for the alternative, we're missing the point. We're actually missing the point. 
we're still focusing on the illness when we're going for the alternative. Um, here's how I want to explain how it really works and why I do what I do and why I want to develop a healing sanctuary. Um, the reason I want to develop a healing sanctuary and why I want to bring people on an online platform or a course or whatever it is, is because I want to take you away from this paradigm that has you believing that cancer is a thing. And I'm going out on a limb here and I'm going to say something that some still today in the medical paradigm, in the materialist science paradigm, will knock what I'm saying. But I know this to be true, okay? So, um, because this is what happened to me and I have seen it happen with many, many other people. I've seen it. Dr. Kelly Turner, who does the radical remission, has seen it. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza has seen it. Dr. Bruce Lipton has seen it. So, um, so I'm going to talk about this right here, right now, because it's really important. Whether you go conventional or whether you go alternative, it doesn't matter. The point that is being missed is that the issue is your belief that cancer is a thing that you now have to focus on eradicating. That is the issue. It doesn't matter whether you, you, you try to eradicate it from the, from the conventional or the alternative. It's being done from a place of fear. And even when you eradicate it with conventional, the fear continues because people are going to tell you, now you're in remission, this type of cancer comes back, whatever, whatever. They're going to tell you, I had to go through all that. I know that. Here's the thing. I didn't know that I was doing this at that time. I realized it after I did it because I was guided to do it. I didn't know why I was doing it. I removed myself from the environment as soon as I was healed. I removed myself from the environment where everybody was, you're in remission, you have to be careful, you had stage four, now you have to do this, you have to go back for scans, for this, for that. I removed myself from that fear-based environment and I started to live life. What propelled me to do that? It was the guidance I felt because I had a near-death experience and I knew that the person I was before who feared cancer was the one that got cancer. I could not go back to being that person. This is what drives me to do everything I do. Um, <clears throat> when I take people on my retreats, when I take you away for five days, seven days, 10 days, here's what the idea is why I do what I do. In those 10 days, those seven days, or whatever it is, if we're on a cruise or whatever, <clears throat> I want to cocoon you, <clears throat> excuse me, cocoon you in a world where illness doesn't exist. And that is the point that many people are missing, many people who do alternative treatment. They're still focusing on the illness. They're still not getting my point. I want to cocoon you in a world where illness doesn't exist where you see and feel what it, what it feels like to be a healthy and well person. And, and you start to get to know who are you? Who would I be if I was abundant, if I was joyful, if I was healthy? And you start to get into that energy. Energetically, that's who you start to become while you are cocooned with me on that cruise. And those of you who came on the cruise will vouch that that's what happened, whether they realized it or not. They will also vouch that we very rarely even talked about cancer. Very rarely. <clears throat> we were so focused on finding out who we are. Um, what are we? What drives us? What is our passion? What is our calling? We were so focused on having fun, finding our joy, um, being part of the wonder of, of the world, being, being in Alaska, in the energy of Alaska, that when people got off the ship, they were on a natural high. The point is that if you can be in that state for a prolonged period of time, that is what you will create in the world around you. And your body will reflect that. Your body will support that. That is my point. 
It is energy. We are made of pure energy. And the more we focus on, I have to eradicate this illness, even if it's alternative, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So I hope my message was clear. Um, and that is what I want to create in my healing sanctuaries. And when people approach me about healing sanctuaries, um, you know, and I really appreciate that people are approaching me, but I really need, um, I need people who can help me from the ground up. Literally, we need structures, physical places. We need um, people who can help me administratively run places, funding to fund such places. This is what we need. We don't need people to come in and say things like, oh, you need a place that has to have access to organic food and pure water. That's all secondary. That's the physical. That's the physical. Um, my sanctuary is more about getting people into the right energy field when a lot of other things won't matter when you're in the right energy field. But of course, if there are people who are just wanting to cross over and they're nearing the end of their time here in this world, that will also be honored and respected within that sanctuary. Um, so that would give you a clearer understanding of where I stand when it comes to wellness and healing. It's not about healing illness. It's about really living in your full life, in your fullness. Um, if I could create virtual reality goggles that would keep you in that for as long as you need to be until you can manifest it on your own, it's like training wheels on a bicycle and then take off your goggles and see, okay, I'm in that energy space. Now I can actually create it. That's, that's really what I'm trying to say here. Um, that's what my, my retreats, um, that's, the, that's the aim behind my online workshop, my online course, is to get you online and create this kind of um, cocoon to bring you into with the communities, my online communities. That is what I'm here to create. That is my mission. It's to show you a different way of healing that is far beyond just the physical, because even alternative therapies are still focused on the physical, except for you, for a few that help you, like um, um, like homeo homeopathy and many other that works with energy. I love energy healing. So thank you for that question, Susanna. You gave me the opportunity to speak out on that. And I think we have one more, and it's from Angie Flowerpot. I love your last name, Flowerpot. <laughs> How would you deal with feeling regrets after a loved one has passed? So um, that's a very easy one. Um, first of all, I'm sorry that um, if you've lost a loved one, I've, I'm really sorry. Uh, um, and I want you to know that your loved one is fine. And the way to deal with regrets is to know that your loved one can hear you. Speak to them. Even if you speak to them in your own mind, speak to them. Um, speak to them aloud if you want to when you're alone in a room. They can hear you. Tell them the regrets you're feeling. Tell them you love them and know that they would want you to know that they want you to be happy. They do not hold anything against you. They do not judge you. They have only pure, unconditional love for you. They really do. They cannot hold on to and they do not hold on to um, any judgment or hatred or anything in that realm. It doesn't exist in that realm. If they could communicate with you, which they do try to, they would want you to know that um, they would want you to know that they want you to be happy and that they love you unconditionally. That's what they want you to know. They will try to communicate with you, so look out for signs, but please do express whatever you feel to them and allow yourself to let it go. Once you express it, know that they can hear you, listen out for their answers, but allow yourself to let it go because what would make them happy is to see you happy. And thank you for that question, Angie. Um, and so let's take, do we have one or two? Let's take one or two from listeners. Um, and uh, go ahead. We have Danny in the background. There have been, ooh, hundreds and hundreds of questions. Um, so I'm going to try and pull them up in the order that, uh, that I got them in. Uh, this one came in from uh, Alu Sawaki. And I do apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. It says, hi, Anita. Hi. In your opinion... What are the main blockages towards abundance and weight loss? Um, so in my opinion, a couple of things. 
Uh, a lot of it is to do with our belief system. But one thing is that many of us are unwilling to get out of our comfort zone. Um, if you listen to your inner self and your messages, that's only one part of it. And probably I should mention this more often and I don't, is that when we listen to it, the messages are always um, loving. Any fear-based messages are your mind trying to talk you out of it. But our guidance system, very often when it gives us messages, even though they're loving, they can be trying to guide us out of our past conditioning. And coming out of our past conditioning can take us out of our comfort zone. So you have to be willing to come out of your com comfort zone for both um, abundance, weight loss, but also with many other things. Um, listen to those messages, make note of them, and and it is almost guaranteed that in order to really make changes in your life, in your weight, in your abundance situation, you do have to come out of your comfort zone. Many people feel that, oh, this is uncomfortable. It means it can't be true for me. That's actually not, not true. Um, when the things that are in your comfort zone are your habits, they are your conditioning. Um, that's why comfort foods are called comfort foods because those are in your comfort zone because you've been conditioned to eat those things your whole life and then you think, oh, um, I got to go back and eat those things when I'm feeling down. Now, maybe over the years you're eating too much of the things that your body is saying, no, that's not what I want. So I encourage people to actually listen to their bodies. Um, even though I always say to people, eat chocolate, blah, blah, blah. The thing to do is um, I do eat chocolate, but I do listen to my body as well. Uh, I listen to my body a lot. And if I have had too much gluten, I do cut it right back. If I've had too much sugar, I do cut it right back. So it's not that um, it's not that I eat things with gay abandon. But at the same time, I do know that one size does not fit all. If your body is okay with gluten, fine, go for it. If it's okay with sugar, if it's okay with anything, that's fine. But what I would suggest you do is that you tune in and ask, what is it I am trying to do? What am I trying to achieve? Do I want to be lighter? Do I want to be more agile? Do I want to be wealthier? Am I struggling with money? Tune in. What do I want to do now for me? Ask your guides. What should, uh, what should I do for me? Listen to those messages and be prepared that many of the messages will take you out of your comfort zone. So the key is coming out of your comfort zone. We'll go with another one. I think we can take maybe one or two more at the most. One more, yes. The next question is from Jin Boswick, who says, my big issue is how to deal with the incredibly negative, intense, almost aggressive ego voice that tries to drown me. I am deeply connected to not hearing it. This voice derails me, takes all the wind out of my sails, and then all my energy goes towards repairing my boat instead of sailing in joy and service. Jin asks, what is the purpose of this nasty voice, and how can it be so desperately unhelpful to me and the world of people that I could maybe be helping instead? That's a great question. So my sense is that voice comes from somewhere in your childhood and your upbringing. And the reason why it's so strong is because at some point when you were younger, um, you believed that your survival depended on it. And you may come from a loving family, so I don't want to blame your family. But when we're children, we interpret things very differently from how our parents intend us to interpret them. And maybe you were a very sensitive child, you were an empath, but your parents didn't recognize that. And maybe with the best of intentions, your, your parents only wanted what was right or what was best for you. Um, they wanted to discipline you. But 
as children, all we really want is our parents' love. That's the biggest thing we want is love, even as adults. Um, and while I'm at it, I should say that, that every single person who comes to you for anything, really all they're looking for is love and approval, love and approval. Um, so anyway, that's what children want, love and approval. So if you have kids, just remember that's all they want, love and approval. You can discipline them and all that, but give them your love and give them your approval. Um, so at some level you believed, maybe mistakenly, that your survival depended on you, um, on you being really tough on yourself. In other words, you beat yourself up if you didn't do things a certain way. And, you, and what happens is that we do things a certain way and we beat ourselves up so that we don't have to deal with someone else criticizing our, 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 us. So when you're a child and you feel the criticism of someone else who means a lot to you, it can be very, very, very um, painful to feel the criticism of someone. And when you felt it once or twice, to prevent it from happening again, you criticize yourself so that you make the correction before you get that pain. It's almost like a protection. So this, this new voice kicks in. Um, it kicks in to protect you from hearing that external voice from the person who matters to you. I hope I'm making sense. It's like this, it's your own personal um, survival mechanism going, I better tell you what to do. I better criticize you so you get it right so that you don't have to bear the pain of the other person outside of you who means a lot to you criticizing you. And so you develop it. It's a conditioned response that you develop, which is not your higher self. It's a survival mechanism to protect you from getting the criticism from the outside world. Unfortunately, over a period of time, it really starts to work against you because it stops you from taking risks. It stops you from being yourself. Self. It stops you from doing all that you can be and all that you want to do. Um, so first of all, Jin, you're on the right path because you've recognized it. You've absolutely recognized it. Now, what I would suggest is that you give a stronger voice to the other voice. So despite this voice, this criticism, I would say that you would, um, that, that you need to keep a journal or go into a deep space of contemplation or meditation and ask yourself, what are the things that you would do if you did not have this voice bringing you down? And keep asking yourself that question every day, even 25 times a day. What would I do if this voice did not, was not destructive, if this voice wasn't intent on destroying me. What would I do? What would I be doing? And keep asking that and focus on that and give that what you're focusing on more power. Give so, um, so it's as simple as that. What would I be doing instead if I did not have this voice overriding me and overpowering me? What, and another question you can ask is if this voice was a person, what would I say to it? What would I say to this person? And I want you to say it. And here's a third thing I could do that's coming to my mind now, is that you could even do a little process, a little ceremony, where you give that voice a form, give it a color, and then visualize it um, coming into form, and then you kind of disintegrating it and dissolving it and having it disappear or even you um, setting it on fire or destroying it in some way. You could create a little ceremony around it. I find sometimes creating ceremony around these things works. You can do any and all of these things to give that voice form, to destroy it. But the main thing is you want to develop the other side, which is your true inner voice and give that a voice. So keep asking yourself, what would I do? Who am I supposed to be? Who would I have been if that voice wasn't intent on, on belittling me? So that's the important thing. Give the other voice a chance. So now um, I would like to, Danny is prompting me that we've had quite a few emails from people asking me more about this shift course that I'm doing. So I'm really excited about it. It starts this 
Tuesday. It's a course about journeying to the other side where I take people across the veil um, through an experiential journey. I will also speak to you a little bit about it. I am going to include the link on how you can find out more information about this course. So there's going to be a link right under this video. <clears throat> so please look out for that link and it's just to take you for more information. There's a video there as well, an interview I did with Stephen Dynan of the Shift Network. It's a five week live online course. And here's the beauty of it. You can, if you purchase the course and you can't be live online, you can listen to it and watch it anytime. But here's the second thing. If you can be live online, um, you can interact with me. So the Q&A will be interactive, not like here where I kind of talk to you and you write in the comments. It'll be video. You will tune in via Zoom call where I will be able to see you and I'll be able to see all the little, all the little postage stamp size pictures of everybody. You'll be able to see me. And then when I take the questions, I will actually be able to see you face to face as I answer the question and you'll be able to speak your question to me in real time. And that's the beauty of it. But again, if you can't make it live, you'll be able to make it after you'll be able to watch it back after. The other thing is you'll be able to watch it over and over again, which is what I would ask you to do. The other beauty of it is that Shift has also created an online uh, a Facebook group so that anybody who has enrolled in this course, not all their other courses, but in this course, um, will have membership into this private Facebook group where we can build a community of all of you together where you can discuss the course content after each event, after each course airs. You can discuss it together and I will be giving you exercises and stuff to do during the week and, you, and I'll be giving you experiments and you guys can do it with each other and you can discuss it within this group. And this is what I mean about being with your tribe, being with people who you can speak to on the same wavelength. Um, and so whether you're going through an illness or not, whether you're going through abundance issues, whether whatever it is you're going through, just life challenges, or you feel that you haven't found your purpose, all of these things are the different things that we're going to be uncovering during this five-week course. Um, and we are going to really take it up a notch with energy experiments as well as bringing you together as a community because when you come together as a community, things can unfold exponentially. So I do hope you'll join me on that course, but whichever way, I'll be back here again next Sunday live. In the meantime, I would love for you to sign up for, for my newsletter. Um, please go to my website at anitamurjani.com because if you sign up for my newsletter, you will be finding out about things like the course, um, and about my YouTube channel. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel and you will find out stuff about the new portal that I plan to be starting, which should be up by September or October of this year. It'll be a new membership portal where people will have access to stuff 24 hours of the day. Um, this is the first step towards creating a sanctuary where people can feel high vibes, wellness, and so on. And so the first step was to have an online portal before I can have a brick and mortar sanctuary. Um, so to find out more about all these things, please sign up to my newsletter and you will be involved from the ground up on everything. That's at anitamorjani.com. I'll put in the link below. Um, last week, I also asked you guys about cruises and where we would like to go. An overwhelming number of you said Europe, European cruise. So yes, let's do that. Let's do a European cruise in 2020. Um, Northern Lights if we can, but even if the Northern Lights don't work out, because a lot of people are saying Northern Lights means going on land for three days and or going into a smaller boat um, after and during part of the cruise, which might be complicated with all the stuff that everybody will be carrying. Um, it will, we are definitely thinking along the lines of a European cruise. So those of you in Europe and those of you not in Europe who are willing to fly to Europe, um, I would love for you to join me and support me on this one. And uh, we are thinking 10 days uh, and would love, love, love it. So now 
One of the reasons why I like a longer period of days is because we can be in this cocoon longer and create this energy and live in this energy for longer so that that's what you take out in the world and that is who you are and that's what you kind of manifest for you. So there you have it. Thank you so much for tuning in and I can't wait to see you all next week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.